Um, and so what's actually um, lost then by humans uh, when they sin is that they actually fail to distribute God's glory to creation. And that's the larger problem, and that's what's often missed with this whole why the gospel business is that people tend to make the, the conversation stop with, well, I just need to get forgiven for my sins. That's not really the, 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 the deeper problem is that actually that you're not distributing glory. And so God has to bring, like, salvation means a restoration of your capacity to do that. Like, you're not just saved whenever, like, you you're, you're, you have your sins forgiven. You're not fully saved until you're actually functioning the way that God intends you to function within creation. Something happened in... In the midst of this culture. What you're describing, your experience, is all of a sudden now... And it's an intentional journey. Dr. Matthew Bates, welcome to Faith in the Folds. How are you today, sir? Hey, thanks, Kevin. Um, yeah, no, great today. Uh, it's late afternoon for me, so uh, looking forward to a conversation. And uh, it's actually my daughter's birthday, so I'll be heading home eventually to eat cake. It's only going to get better. It is, yeah. <laughs> That's great. That's wonderful. Well, Dr. Bates, I have, uh, I've enjoyed reading your books Uh and uh, catching up with you on uh, social media and just kind of seeing what you're up to. So thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, to introduce you to uh, the Faith and Folds audience, let me ask, where are you teaching? How long have you been teaching? Uh, and how did you even get into teaching? I'm at Quincy University, and that's in central Illinois, and I've been here 13 years. So uh, now a full professor, believe it or not, which is hard for me to believe. So I've been there that long um, that, you know, I'm, I'm through all that process. No longer um, assistant and, or no, associate no, or whatever. No, yeah, yeah. They just, they, I don't know what they're thinking, but uh, they decided <laughs> to, you know, to, to make me full fledged. So, um, yep, uh, 13 years there. It's a, it's a Catholic Protestant institution, which is, uh, I'm sorry, Catholic institution, but I'm a Protestant, uh, which is a, an interesting point um, that's not really a point of tension, although people often think it is. Um, but uh, at least for me, I have a lot of freedom in the classroom, and it's just a great learning opportunity for the students. Yeah, reminds me a little uh, of Michael Gorman, uh, who's yep, in a similar mm -hmm. boat, yeah. Yep, yep. And uh, Michael Gorman and I probably have very similar theological views. In fact, I'm certain we do, <laughs> um, as I, I'm, I'm deeply immersed in his work, and I know him outside of, um, yeah, outside the context of mm -hmm. just a, the academic world a little bit, too. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, anyway, I got into teaching. Um, I wouldn't say I fell into it, as it was certainly something that I discerned um, when I was in seminary. I thought I might be interested in going on to teach, but I didn't know whether that was possible. At first, I didn't even know would I be even any good at biblical studies, mm -hmm. um, and uh, and still wasn't certain about that at the end of uh, my process of the of the master's degree. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I took a couple of years off in between and was working as an electrical engineer, and um, as part of that, applied to PhD programs. And you know, it's a little bit like whenever you, you go on and do PhD work, um, there's no guarantee you're going to get a job when you're done mm -hmm. in the academic world. I mean, um, so, you know, I went to the the schools uh, that I thought gave me the best shot at that, um, actually getting a job uh, with the hope of teaching, but you don't know how that's going to work out. So for me, it was also just partly an intellectual journey. I wanted to be well equipped to serve in the church. I, I didn't really feel a call to be a pastor, but I was open to that. And I'm still open to that. Who knows where the Lord will lead? Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, I ended up um, finishing a PhD program at Notre Dame and then ended up at a small Catholic liberal arts college, which is where a lot of Notre Dame graduates end up. Sure. So um, that's just my story very, very briefly, but I love teaching. And so for me, it was, um, yeah, the the fact that I write books has always been secondary to my teaching. I, I didn't get into, you know, the, the academic world because I wanted to write. It was because I wanted to teach. Mm -hmm. And the writing has been more of an accident um, and the, the bigger surprise to me. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, I, I'm curious when you were at Notre Dame, did you ever have any classes with John Meyer? I did, yes. Um, and John Meyer has recently passed away, mm -hmm. but a uh, very famous historical Jesus scholar. Um, his Marginal Jew series is one that 
uh, is still a standard reference work in the field, although it's getting dated, I think. Um, and yeah, uh, John was a very interesting man um, and uh, obviously brilliant. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, he had his quirks. Uh, I could tell you stories. But... <laughs> maybe maybe on a follow up visit. Yeah, yeah, we'll, yeah. Uh, we'll we'll tell stories about our favorite uh, <laughs> favorite heavy hitters in biblical studies. Yeah, uh, John Mayer was very kind. John Meyer was very kind to me. Um, years ago, I emailed him when I was working on my dissertation. And um, we talked about that before we started recording. Um, and I asked him, you know, I, I, I know that your I know that your research in volume one follows this method. Since I'm working on method for you know historiographical method for my dissertation, is do you continue that throughout the whole thing? And he was very complimentary. He appreciated that I was willing to follow up with him, to make sure that he was still. You know, still consistent there. He said he was, and uh, wished me all the best. So, you know, had had no reason to be as kind as he was, or even to write back uh, to the length that he did, but was very kind, very gracious, and um, I, I really appreciated that. So glad that glad that you got to actually take some classes with him. I got one email from. Him. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So, well, I'm. Uh, I, I like how you how you uh, mentioned that you you. Know, are, are open to pastoral ministry. That is, uh, th that's something that I f really fell into. I, I went into uh, my doctorate uh, in, in hoping to, to start teaching um, and then realized that where, where I was at Asbury, there was a, there was a church that we were attending that you know, was in need of Bible teachers. And here I was getting a world-class education and it just, it just made sense. And so when the, uh, when the, head head preacher of that church moved elsewhere to take a teaching job i i, I was sitting here thinking man I, i've got you know i've got this great opportunity to to put these skills into practice and um, that has been a real blessing to me it's it's helpful to be able to distill the kinds of things that guys like yourself write and publish and make that available for a church audience. So one, thank you for giving me, uh, a minister, good things that I can uh, turn into for uh, for church audiences. But uh, you know, that your work and the work of many others, like Michael Gorman, who we mentioned a minute ago, has really f filled me in you know, just further exploring you know, that, my understanding of you know, the Bible in general, Paul's letters in particular, and, and things along those lines. Thanks. Yeah, we're, we're certainly all collaborating together, and there, there's obviously a, a lot of overlap between pastoral roles and scholarly roles as they all kind of blend together in the end. Yeah, yeah. Uh, one more get-to-know-you question. What's a favorite Bible verse, and and why that one? A favorite Bible verse? Um, well, yeah. I love and notice Bible, I didn't say so. the favorite, right? Because yeah. you know, who can narrow it just down to one? Yeah, right? well, I'm always, I, I've always been partial, especially to Philippians. So I I, I think I, that that passage in Philippians is always one in Philippians 3 that's um, that's been on my heart where Paul, you know, talks about all the things that, you know, that he could boast in, in terms of what it might be as fleshly accomplishments. Right. But then goes on to say, uh, you know, I consider them a loss for the sake of Christ. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, I love as part of that, like as he continues on, you know, saying that that he wants to know Christ, the power of his resurrection and fellowship with his sufferings. Right. And, and becoming in some way like him and, and 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 so that he can attain to the resurrection from the dead. And as part of that, I, I also have always just found super challenging. Just says not that I've already gotten there. Right. Not that I've already attained right. all this. Right. Um, and I think that's uh, been a verse that's that's always meant a lot to me because it's helped motivate me to keep to keep striving to realize, um, yeah, that it's a lifelong process that we're learning to be disciples of Jesus together. And um, no matter how far we get, um, there's always room to continue to grow. And God knows we got a long ways to go. Right. Um, mm -hmm. I, I discover that uh, each day. <laughs> yeah, me too. Me too. Um, oddly enough, I am uh, in among several other projects. I'm writing Bible study curriculum on Philippians, and the title of the uh, of the book is "Sharing His Sufferings," drawing mm -hmm. from that same passage mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. So yeah, passage. it's it's a um, very very important passage, and uh, and I appreciate Paul's uh, Paul's humility there. Say, you know, I'm I'm not there yet. So yeah, well. Let's uh, let's segue to uh, to one of your books that you uh, 
wrote uh, relatively recently a book called Salvation by Allegiance Alone, Rethinking Faith, Works, and the Gospel of Jesus the King. Uh, many Christians probably think of something like Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, right? For by grace you've been saved through faith. Faith there means belief, right? If I believe God's saving work through Jesus, I'm good to go. But in this book, you know, with more nuance than what I'm going to give right now, you argue that there's more to it than that. Why is that? Yeah, because the word underneath faith um, and the word underneath grace, like these, these are in, our English glosses, don't really help us to understand very well um, the nuances of the Greco-Roman world in which Paul was situated and speaking into, right? And so we have the word pistis, uh, the word um, translated faith. Um, uh, it's it's a, a more complicated word than um, than just belief, right? Or even than just trust as those would be maybe the two most popular glosses, especially in, in the English-speaking world, um, but that the word can go beyond that, and it also means faithfulness or loyalty or allegiance. And this can be easily demonstrated by looking at the literature from the Greco-Roman world and in the New Testament itself. Uh, the word the word pistis needs to be translated faithfulness many times in the New Testament. Um, and, uh, and so it's something that's uh, somewhat well-known to scholars, but interestingly, I think, has not um, received the attention that um, it needs, partly maybe because of anxieties around works and around grace and not wanting to violate grace and realizing, okay, we're not saved by works, so how does this whole system work? Uh, so trying to nuance that better. And then it, that passage is a really interesting one, as um, it's often assumed when Paul says, um, you know, that we're saved by, um, you know, by grace through faith, that the through faith is actually our faith, that it's our faith toward Jesus that's intended there. It's, that's actually not clear. The text whose faith is in view, it may be the Christ's faithfulness. By grace, you're saved through the Christ's faithfulness may be intended there. And um, scholars are actually split around that. If you read, you know, like more technical Ephesians commentaries, some will see this as speaking about divine action. And the evidence for that comes from the very next clause, right? As um, he says, this is not of yourselves, right? It's the gift mm -hmm. of God, uh, which would emphasize divine action on our behalf, right? Like that it's the Christ's faithfulness that saves us. Um, but um, the traditional view is that this is our human faith toward toward the Christ that saves us. And I think if if we do understand it that way, and I think that's a, a, a there's it's a very defensible you know um, a way of putting it um, that yeah that we should see something like loyalty or allegiance because we're talking about not just faith in Jesus in general, but faith in the Christ, the King, uh, and that suggests a loyalty or allegiance framework. Yeah, I'm intrigued by this notion of faithfulness of the Christ. Um, that's something that I think I was was first introduced to when uh, when I was an undergraduate. I was uh, I was minoring in Greek. Um, I, I was actually a history major, not a Bible major, in undergrad, and uh, decided to minor in Greek because I thought it would be fun. Why didn't I know then? Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe the Lord was moving me in a direction, but. Um, one of my professors, you know, would talk to us uh, about the Greek phrase uh, "pistis Christu," mm -hmm. and uh, I I remember hearing that and thinking hey, that's that's interesting. But I didn't have any more exposure to it until a couple of years later, when again, by God's grace, I discerned that seminary was where I needed to be. Uh, if you don't mind walking us through a little bit more this issue of faith. Faith in Christ versus faithfulness of Christ, or rather Christ's own faithfulness. What What's the deal there? And, and maybe what are some passages that, uh, just off the top of your head, I didn't plan to ask you about this, sure. but what are some passages maybe that we can look at and say, oh, okay, it could be understood this way or this way? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, the, the debate is whether the phrase pistis Christu should be translated faith in Christ, or if it's, you know, pistis Christu Yesu, like faith in Jesus Christ, uh, or or exactly how that should be translated, or if it should be translated instead, um, the faithfulness of Jesus Christ, um, which would emphasize, on the one hand, uh, like if it's faith in Christ, that he's the object of faith, right? Mm -hmm. If it's the faithfulness of Christ, then the Christ is the actor, right? He's the one who's performing the faithful action himself. So there's quite a large difference. Um, and there are a number of passages that are implicated here, um, Romans 3, 21 and 22, um, Galatians, uh, is it 2, 16, maybe 3, 16? I mean, there's a number of passages. The Pistis Christi passages are are in some fairly central texts that have to do with justification, mm -hmm. uh, and that's why it's, it's led to um, a large discussion. 
Um, interestingly, I think that the discussion may be starting to come to a close. We'll see as uh, there's been an article written by Kevin Grosso uh, in recent years, um, and uh, he, I think, has definitively shown and we'll see if scholarship ends up agreeing with him, but at least I've been persuaded that the, the traditional objective genitive is something that can't be demonstrated as a viable option at all grammatically, uh, that it's grammatically impossible. Um, and uh, it's an interesting case that he's made, published in a very credible journal, Journal for the Study of New Testament. It's one of the more <laughs> prestigious journals. Uh, but Kevin Grosso, I think, has shown that um, the objective genitive is no longer a viable option, so that those 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 passages that have been traditionally translated faith in Christ need to be translated the faithfulness of the Christ. Um, we'll see. Um, or well, his his argument there's also a third way possibility, and he actually he favors that. So I can't get into the technical details of all that right here. Yeah. Um, but um, and uh, just so no one is confused about this, um, nobody is denying that we need to be loyal toward King Jesus. We need to trust him. <laughs> right. There are other passages right. that would 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 implicate that apart from the Pistis Christi passages. The, mm -hmm. That's not the question. Like everybody agrees, yes, we need to have faith in Christ. The question is whether a specific some specific passages intend that. Right. There are other passages that clearly do intend it, but whether some certain Certain specific passages intend that or not. That's what's been um, a matter of debate. And, and there are passages that are particularly important theologically as they're connected to justification. Yeah. So again, for a recap, it's not that anyone is saying faith in Christ is out, right? That's off the table. <laughs> That's yeah. not the issue. It's yes. that within certain texts, they're probably better understood as referring to Christ's own faithfulness, Christ's yes. own fidelity or uh, allegiance, as uh, as you've aptly titled the book, Christ's own allegiance towards God. L let me ask, what is the significance of, of Christ's own allegiance? Why, wh why would that matter so much? Well, it's because it's by his loyalty that we're then enabled to become loyal, would one, be one way of thinking about it. Um, as Paul says in Romans 1, 16 through 17, he says, you know, the gospel is the power of God, you know, and um, and and then he says, because in it, right, the righteousness of God is revealed, and he says that it's by pistis for pistis. Uh, and so he uses that faith language. It's translated in a variety of ways um, by New Testament scholars, but it's best understood as, a, I think, that the by, it's, it's best understood as an instrumental idea, like it's by, like, the faithfulness of someone, mm -hmm. uh, but that then is then for the purpose of the faithfulness of somebody, right? Like, that seems to be the the, the best sense that we can make of this in the Greek. Mm -hmm. um, and this this leads into the idea that it's Christ's faithfulness that then stimulates our faithfulness to him. And so the way that it works is this, that Jesus was faithful to God the Father and to all of God's people in going the path of the cross. And he's also faithful as the high priest in offering his own self, right? And that it's as he's faithful in this way uh, that we that he opens up a space for us to be faithful to, so that we can then be loyal to the king, so that his faithfulness is purposed toward ours. Um, and so when we fail to see that motif, we don't realize that we're actually following the Christ pattern. We're imitating him. Why, why are we saved by faithfulness or by faith? Why are we saved by pistis? Well, it's because Jesus actually was saved in the same way. He was loyal in going to the cross, and God mm -hmm. vindicated him and raised him from the dead. We follow the same pattern. We enter into the cruciform life, and then in so doing, then we are justified by faith too. Yeah, yeah. That... Uh... That makes sense. I, I think in the past, I have understood that phrase there uh, in Romans 1 to refer to just the the ongoing development of our faith. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I go from one degree of faith to another degree of yeah, faith. Yeah, that's how it's sometimes translated, by faith from first to last, is how the NIV translates that. Okay. I think that we can demonstrate that's not a solid translation, um, yeah. and partly because of the way it parallels Habakkuk right after that, like as Paul quotes Habakkuk and says, the righteous person will live by faith, right? Um, the the ekpistaos there in the Habakkuk passage clearly refers instrumentally to the person's faith, right? And so it's likely that Paul, right before that, when he uses that ekpistaos language, also intends an instrumental idea. And mm -hmm. then later on in Romans, in Romans 3.21 and 3.22, he talks about 
um, the, that, the, that the righteousness of God that we have is for those who perform the pistis action. And he uses the ace, uh, it's, it's in Greek, it's the it's ace pistuanti, I think, or whatever it might be, um, as it's, that's not quite right. Um, but it's the, it's, he uses the ace preposition as, as purposed also, um, as part of a purpose clause. And it's clearly linked back to Romans 1.17, yeah. uh, his further clarification of it in Romans 3.21 through 22. So check that out. Um, and uh, we're getting into the more of the weeds here, the technical details. But I think a, a more convincing exegesis of that passage is to see it as a statement of, of instrumentality followed by a statement of purpose. Yeah. So the ac pista os ace piston. That, um, that, that also makes sense when you take into account at a, you know, at, at kind of a larger level, the, um, the way that, you know, divine initiative operates in generating means by which people can enter into relationship with God throughout the entire Old Testament, you know, we call those covenants. Mm -hmm. And it's always on the basis of divine initiative that God establishes a covenant with, you know, uh, I, I like how Sandra Richter puts it in her book, Epic of Eden. Um, you know, a Adam, uh, Noah, uh, Abraham, Moses, and David. If, if you can name, remember those five names, right, you can kind of remember the story of the whole Old Testament. Um where you know it's divine initiative that initiates you know, that begins all of those covenants, um, and then you know a model of some f way of faithfulness, some way of right living, is uh, is established. It, Jesus too, by by way of analogy, would would have um, would have de demonstrated you know divine initiative in his faithfulness, then by establishing a way for our. You know our initiative, our, our our faithfulness as well. I yeah, hope that connection it, makes sense. Uh, it's that's that's rough and, and kind of raw, but I, it does, and it, <laughs> it helps us understand grace too. That this is like part of God's grace to us, right? Is is that Jesus does perform the faithful action? Like we tend to dehistoricize grace and make it an abstract. But like really the way grace tends to be used in the New Testament is to speak of a concrete gift that's given in history and time, primarily the gift of Christ himself as the king, right? And what the king's done, right? Like that mm -hmm. is the grace. So the king's faithfulness then is part of the grace. It's part of the gift as it opens up. A, it opens up a space then for us to respond uh, by um, reciprocating, by giving allegiance, right? By we, we respond to his loyalty by our loyalty, right? And so it's not something that denies grace, but actually is something that's within the framework of the economy of grace. Yeah. Um, okay. Just that phrase right there, the economy of grace. Somebody's gonna think, "What podcast did I open up?" <laughs> but the but the notion of the economy of grace, you know, in in the ancient world, right? There were certain social obligations attached to, for maybe lack of a better term, but not intending to be crass. But there were certain sub social obligations attached to gift giving, right? And one of the proper ways to respond to. A, a, a very gracious and generous gift was by you know, showing the recip by the recipient showing their loyalty to the gift giver. All, all of that is you know all of those social conventions are in play, right? Absolutely. With, with grace, as we see it in 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 Paul's letters. Very well said. Yeah, I don't I don't really have anything I can add to that. I think that's, okay. that's perfect. Uh, we'll, perfect. <laughs> perfect. Yep. We'll take that. We'll take yeah. that. Um, so I I think that that's what's so fascinating then about salvation by allegiance alone. I remember I I, I was preaching and teaching at that uh, small church in Kentucky when uh, when I first saw your book, and I think I even just saw the title of it, and it immediately made sense to me. It's like, of course, it it has to be that. It has to be more than just belief. And I've used this analogy in a number of places and will use it again in an upcoming series of lectures at my alma mater uh, for their annual uh, Bible and ministry lectureship. Uh, it's one thing to believe you're married. It's another thing to live like it. Another thing to live like it. And, and the living like it is is the is the point. It is the point of all this. Um, why do some people, or maybe why would some people begin to get uncomfortable and squirm a little bit when we start talking about faithfulness rather than just belief. You mentioned earlier that some people are a little antsy about works. It, are some people maybe afraid that it might sound like we're earning our salvation if if we're saved by faithfulness? Yes. <laughs> yeah, I think there, <laughs> are, there, are, there are people who are concerned about that. Um, 
But the reality is, is that the Bible is quite clear. We're going to be judged on the basis of our works. This is said again and again and again and again, the Old Testament, the New Testament. Um, and so we have to figure out how to integrate that into our theory of salvation. Um, like one way of integrating it would be to see that like, okay, like first we're justified. We have to like, you know, make this decision. And then we we come into a right relationship with God. And then once we're justified by faith alone, well, then good works flow as a natural consequence. That's one way of framing it that plays on the justification, sanctification, division mm -hmm. in salvation. I don't think that actually tracks what the Bible teaches very well. Okay. And that's because um, the word pistis itself is relational and externalized. Um, and so the best studies of pistis that have been done by New Testament scholars, and here we're talking about scholarship that's been been around for a long time, but some, especially in the last 50 years, that have really sharpened the conversation, like Teresa Morgan's book, Roman Faith and Christian Faith, or Nije Gupta's recent book, Paul and the Language of Faith, is that the name of it? Something like that. But uh, David Downs and ben Benjamin Lapinga have a study on Christ's faith, the, the faithfulness of the resurrected Christ, or the faithfulness of the risen Christ. I can't remember the title, a Baylor University Press book. Anyway, all these studies that explore faith quite deeply um, they um, they keep coming back. Peter Oaks' work too uh, keep coming back to the idea that that pistis is something that is relational and externalized, and this is, means it's something that is not just an interior movement of the mind, right? It's something that uh, in the ancient world, like in Paul's world, like people whenever they heard the word pistis, thought about it being something that relates to another person or to something outside the self, and also was something that you could see. It was visibly manifested in some way. Yeah. Um, so it's not a work per se. Um, we wouldn't, but it, but it's something that we might want to see works as fitting within. Right? We would want to say um, that like allegiance or pistis is something that is embodied. It's something that is not separate from our body as if we somehow have a body-mind dualism um, or dichotomy. So I think that it's just more faithful to the New Testament itself to see um, salvation as by faith alone, but by that meaning loyalty or allegiance, yeah. uh, and that seeing works as having a secondary causation within our faith, so that the faith has a priority, um, but the works are something that are a secondary cause within it. This would be essentially the view of early reformers like Martin Bucer. So it does have a, a reform, a Reformation heritage too, even though it's not um, necessarily a Calvinistic one. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Well, that uh, that helps explain a little bit more, maybe why why James says what he says, you know, regarding works and and faith. There, it you know, the two would be. It, is it fair to say that the two would be inseparable? That you know, faith yeah. properly understood as as loyalty or allegiance would would necessarily include demonstrations of that loyalty and allegiance. Hence, works right. Yes, that's right. And so, I mean, I think a better way of putting it than to say like, okay, true mental faith is almost the idea in some circles. True mental faith will then like result in there being an externalized bodily work, right? Like, but it's a causative relationship. Like you have to have like the regeneration and justification to cause then the the work to follow. That's just not a biblical idea. Mm -hmm. uh, the biblical idea is that they're all bound together. That like your like your faith is an embodied one from the get go. There's no such thing as like a first a mental faith that then causes something bodily. That's just not the right way of framing what faith is in the New Testament. So it's a misunderstanding, and it's it's to treat faith as a purely mental thing, yeah. um, which I don't think is what the New Testament um, consistently does with faith. Yeah, yeah, that uh, that makes sense. Moving on from salvation by allegiance alone, which I mean, I, I, we could spend a whole hour on that, right? Um, I uh, I recently read Why the Gospel, um, Living the Good News of King Jesus with Purpose, and I loved it, really, really enjoyed it. In that book, you argue the primary purpose of the gospel is to announce Jesus is the enthroned Christ, which means we now have a king and should honor him as king. But don't you have that backwards? <laughs> is, is, it, is it forgiveness of sins first? What's what's the deal here? Yeah, so I, I think that's one of the things I'm I'm really urgent to try to correct. And part of the reason I wrote the book is that I do think when when you ask the question why the gospel, uh, people think um, like the basic answer that comes immediately to most people's minds is because we need forgiveness of sins. Yeah. And well, we do need forgiveness of sins. That's to frame the gospel from a selfish point of view that ignores what scripture teaches about it because what what we need actually is something first what we need is we need to have a king 
And it's only through a king that forgiveness comes. And that we can't have we can't just abstract forgiveness away from from the idea of there being a king who provides it. So it's only as we give our loyalty to the king that we come into a relationship to him so as to receive benefits like forgiveness. So the gospel's king first. And that's because also, like God's um whole intention in forgiving us isn't just to get rid of the guilt problem as if somehow or another, like like this is the way the gospel is traditionally understood. Like God is righteous, humans are sinners, Jesus is the savior. And so believe in him. And then you get to go to, you get to be reconciled with God and go to heaven or, you know, have eternal life or however yeah. you want to frame that. Mm -hmm. Right. That's a very traditional way of presenting the gospel, but that's actually not what the Bible says. The gospel is at all. The gospel is that Jesus is the Christ and that he took on human flesh that as part of that process, right. That he died for our sins in accordance with the scripture. He was raised on the third day, like that eventually then after being raised, he's seen and and then he's enthroned at the right hand of God, which the New Testament presents as really the climactic moment of the gospel that God has made this Jesus Lord and Christ. Mm -hmm. And then on the basis of that, then the Holy Spirit is sent by the Father and the Son to the people. Um, and then Jesus will come again. That's really a more robust presentation of the gospel. And really, like, why does God give the gospel? It's because we need a king, because the, the problem isn't just to get rid of guilt. It's because God wants us to actually serve within creation in the way God intends. And so um, really the purpose of the gospel is actually restoration. It's not just like to get rid of guilt. It's not just so our sins get forgiven. It's because we need restoration so we can function the way God intended within creation because the gospel is not just about rescuing humans. It's about it's about God rescuing all creation. And in order to do that, he needs to rescue humans as part of the process. And so we don't we we sometimes don't see that or we have a selfish view. We're like, well, I just need to get out of hell and go to heaven is the sure. way a lot of people tend to think of it. Um, but that's not really the, that's not really what the, the Bible teaches about the purpose of the gospel. It's it's not it's not framed right. And not a lot of that was the purpose of the book is to work on a reframing to help the church see that that the gospel is king first and it has to be king first or we've missed it. Yeah, I have, um, you know, in, in the course of reading through your book. I was um, I was teaching on Wednesday nights here at church, uh, class on Colossians, and you know, Colossians is all about you know the the all sufficiency and supremacy of of the enthroned Christ, and um, I, I mentioned it, it 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 became relevant to mention you know that you know upon Jesus's resurrection and his ascension that was his enthronement, um, and, and the conversation started getting into. Well, wasn't he always king? And I said, well, I mean, on, honestly, before um, you know, before the incarnation, we don't just we we just don't really know very much, or not given very much about what precisely Jesus is doing at that point. So uh, let me pose that question to you: um, Prior to Jesus's enthronement, what can we know about what Jesus was up to? I mean, we would want to say that he's the son of God. Um, and so mm -hmm. as God, the son, he's the second person of the Trinity. He's the Logos, right, before he takes on human flesh um, for our sake. So, yes, there's a sense in which God has always reigned and is always the king. But um, I think we also have to recognize that as God is ruling over the earth, he cannot exercise his sovereignty in the way that he would um, that he, the way that that ma that matches his intention for creation without having human rule. Yeah. So like the triune God can't rule creation the way that he designed creation without humans ruling it because he designed it so that the image of, of God would rule creation on his behalf. That's that's how creation is designed to function. Mm -hmm. So the critical the critical thing about the incarnation is that we now have a we now have a human king who is now ruling again, and as he's exalted to the right hand of God, the significance of that is now a human is ruling creation as God intended. So we now have the Son of God as the Son of God in power. Like So there is a progression. So there's a progression in the kind of kingship that he exercises. He rules as the Son of God before the incarnation, but after the incarnation and the enthronement, he rules as Paul puts it in Romans 1.3, he rules as the Son of God in power. Um, which is, I would understand that to be a title that connects to his his new lofty position enthroned at the right hand of God, where he's ruling powerfully. But the significance is now a human is ruling creation. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that, that that makes sense to me. I uh, I definitely wasn't able to put it so eloquently on the spot like that, but um, it really does make sense, particularly when right you you dig 
deeply into into Genesis one and the original intention of uh, of the creation of humans and the royal language that is explicit there. You know, sub subdue and have dominion over. Yeah, and that uh, that that definitely makes sense. That Christ, the the incarnate Christ, who is now exalted, you know, becomes the human king, who can then fulfill the original intention that God had created humans for in the first place. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, that makes sense. With with Christ as the enthroned, or, or, or you know, with Christ's position enthroned at the right hand of God. He it you know it, it enjoys extraordinary glory, and there was one point that I found particularly in, intriguing in why the gospel was your discussion about God's glory, and how God shares His glory with us. First off, what is glory, and do we as humans made in God's image play any role in either sharing God's glory or, or spreading God's glory or, or what? Yes. Um, so glory, then um, there's obviously a variety of ways to to frame what it is um, in the Bible, and I'm not going to be able to do full justice to all that right in this moment. But the, the main idea behind uh, the word doxa in Greek, the word kavod in Hebrew, is a weightiness of presence that connects to honor or renown or fame. And so um, when we hear the word doxa, um, it's connected to um, public reputation, like uh, closely aligned with that. And mm -hmm. that was the chief value in the Roman world. People wanted honor or glory. It was the it was considered like the most important thing to try to strive to get. Like in our culture, people like, might be like, well, I want to get more, more money than anybody else. In Rome, you wanted more honor. Uh, you wanted more glory. That's what you really wanted. Um, and so when we think about this with regard to God, um, God's glory is a complex thing. On the one hand, God has a glory that can never be impeached, and that's a glory that's intrinsic to him that is part of who he is because of his very name. On the other hand, because glory, though, uh, has to do with public reputation, um, God can lose glory. So it's there's a complexity in the Bible's own discourse about glory. On the one hand, God can't ever have his glory lost because it's, it belongs to him as part of his properties, like that he, do, he, he has an appropriate honor because he's valued. Um, on the other hand, there's... Um, yeah, there's a, a a public dimension to that where people don't give God the glory. We call this the ascribed glory. So on the one hand, there's intrinsic glory. On the other hand, there's ascribed or acknowledged glory. Um, and so we have to deal deal with both of those categories to deal to do to do service to like a biblical theology of glory. Um, and so what's actually um, lost then by humans uh, when they sin is that they actually fail to distribute God's glory to creation. And that's the larger problem, and that's what's often missed with this whole why the gospel business is that people tend to make the, the conversation stop with, well, I just need to get forgiven for my sins. That's not really the, 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 the deeper problem is that actually that you're not distributing glory. And so God has to bring, like, salvation means a restoration of your capacity to do that. Like, you're not just saved whenever, like, you you're, you're, you have your sins forgiven. You're not fully saved until you're actually functioning the way that God intends you to function within creation. That's when you've reached the fullest salvation. And as part of that, there has to be a glory recovery. And Paul signals all this for us in Romans, Romans 1, Romans 3, but we often miss it, right? As Paul talks about us exchanging the glory of God uh, for images made to look like mortal man, like we start worshiping idols. So what do we do? We, we actually, like, we exchange the glory. Um, and that we then, Paul, uh, we end up in a situation, as Paul sums up in Romans 3, he says, for all have sinned and are lacking the glory of God. Like, but Paul doesn't say, for all have sinned and therefore are falling short of God's bar of justice. Um, that's true. We are falling short of God's bar of justice, but that's not Paul's precise point. His precise point is that we're actually lacking in glory. All have sinned and are lacking glory, and, and this is because we're not distributing glory to creation. Then we get to Romans 8. Paul talks about how creation is longing for the sons of God to be revealed because creation is yearning for that glory. So it's all this whole glory discourse is interconnected, and we recover glory then um, by gazing on King Jesus. That's that's part of our salvation, is that that's why the incarnation matters. King Jesus comes, and then he we see who he is. He's exalted to the right hand of God and ruling the universe, but the part of the significance of his rule is that we now have the opportunity to gaze on him. And that's how that's why salvation works through his kingship, too, is that he is now the paradigm of humanity, and we can now look at him as the ideal king, and we gaze upon him. And as we do, we come to be conformed to 
that image so that we come to be ideal kings and queens too, as we come to be conformed to his image. And that completes the process of salvation for us. Uh, and so we have to see image transformation as being intrinsic to our salvation, um, not something that's just some sort of extra thing. Uh, and I think we have not done, um, uh, we've not done enough with that uh, in, in terms of a biblical theology as we put together salvation. Yeah, yeah. Well, as we uh, as we kind of come to a close here, if someone wants to share the gospel with uh, with someone else, I mean, the Bible study or something along those lines, what are maybe some uh, some some steps or some key points in order that you would recommend they they do that? Yeah. So my last chapter of the book, um, well, really the last two chapters have to do with like the crisis around um, people um, falling away, the nuns and the duns, right? Mm -hmm. And then on the one hand, uh, on the one hand, then the final chapter has to do with how to gospel in reverse yeah. is what I call it, gospeling backwards with purpose. Um, and so I, I, I think that we tend to start in the wrong direction when we present the gospel. Um, and we tend to start with um, like the idea of like God, you know, being righteous and humans being sinners. And so therefore we need a savior. Instead, we need to start with a claim, Jesus is king, right? And um, and we, I think it's actually like on a, that's, that's like in terms of on a formal level, on a practical level, we maybe need to start by telling our own story about how we didn't allow God to be king. We didn't allow Jesus to rule. We were following, we were being our own Lord and uh, we were all, we were making our own decisions about how to live life and how that worked out for us, right? Tell about some of our brokenness and then tell about how we came to see that actually Jesus is the king and that his way of life, right, is the good news, like uniting ourselves to his kingship, right? It's through that that I found forgiveness. It's through that that I began to find restoration. It's through that that I began to find a true community that together is trying to be conformed in the image of, of this king. Yeah. And, um, and so we need to start with the idea of a king. Uh, that's, I think, the the most basic advice that I would want to give. I have a lot more to say about it, but we need to start there. We need to start, instead of saying, you need a savior, we need to start by saying, Jesus is the king. And when I discovered that, I began to flourish. That's a that's a different way of, of presenting the gospel. Yeah. Do you think maybe by starting elsewhere that uh, that has you know, tarnished or, or maybe diminished our ability to... Uh, it's to bring people in, you talk about the nuns and the duns, you know, to, to bring people in or maybe to keep people in yeah. the church. Uh, it's dehumanizing. The, 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 the classic way of presenting the gospel has nothing to do with you personally, um, other than like you need to acknowledge you're sinful in some way and that you need a savior. But it ha it has nothing to do with like who you uniquely are and like your unique failings and the unique need for you to be restored so you can you can serve God given your unique gifts. Right. Like that, like it's not about restoration, the traditional gospel presentation. It's only about like it's only about like rescue so you can go to some future heavenly bliss. It's not about a holistic bodily restoration so that you actually are transformed into a new person. Um, but this new person is something that is still you, like uniquely you. Mm -hmm. Right. And that God wants to save like who you are, not just like apply some blood to everybody. Um, and I think that, yeah, it's dehumanizing whenever we get the gospel wrong, and that turns people away. Yeah. Um, letting someone be you know, the unique them that God that God crafted, that uh, that reminds me of our conversation just a moment ago of, uh, of, of glory and how that is one way that we would bring full, fuller glory to God, right, is by, you know, by using our unique giftedness in, yeah. um, in, in furthering his kingdom. Yeah. Well, Matthew, I, thank you so much for the conversation. Had a had a delightful time. Um, where can we keep up with your work? And is there anything new that you're uh, into that we can know about? Uh, well, you could follow me on social media. Connect with me. MatthewWBates.com um, is my website, but it's also my Twitter handle is MatthewWBates. Uh, so pretty easy to find in that way. Um, I'm not on Twitter a lot. Facebook's probably a better place to connect with me because I kind of hate Twitter or X or whatever it's called. Um, but I'm sometimes it's called these there. days. Yeah, but I'm sometimes I'm sometimes on there. Um, as far as far as new work, um, yeah, the Why the Gospel is my most recent book, uh, published by Erdman. So you can yep you can find it uh, wherever you like to buy books. I'll put a link um, in the description below. Yeah, yeah, I think uh, it's uh, some sixteen dollars on Amazon right now. So if Amazon's your jam, you could you can get it there. Um, yeah, but I do have a new book that will be coming out, uh, God willing, maybe in a year, a little more than a year with Brazos, 
Okay. Um, and uh, we don't have a firm title yet. Um, the tentative title is Beyond the Salvation Wars. So we'll see. But it's um, it's a deliberate follow up to my earlier books, Salvation by Allegiance Alone and Gospel Allegiance, uh, especially dealing with the more controversial areas of salvation. OK, so I'm excited about it. Yeah, me too. Well, Dr. Bates, thank you so much for your time. Appreciate you uh, joining us on Faith in the Folds today. Hope you have a good rest of the day. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you.